Inver in, in the Gaelic language it, it means at the end of water and, and, and Inver so you'll see all through Scotland places called Invergarry, Invermoriston Inverness, so on and so forth and uh, beside, beside all these towns there'll, there'll be a big body of water and that town will be at the headland so Inver at the end of water and Ness is a strip of arable fertile farmland that is in between the sea and fresh water so Inverness, the strip of land between the sea at the end of the loch. Because it was before a time of maps. So, oh, you should go here. Where's that? How'd I get there? Oh, right. Well, it's an, it's an Inverness. It's, it's the, the strip of land at the end of the loch. So it was a way of, of not just naming places, but giving them a description so that when people were travelling, they could see it and they would find it. Whereas now... Most people, you would ask, you know, why is it called Inverness? And they would just say, because that's its name. Welcome to the A Midlife Traveler podcast, where we want you to go see the world. Discover interesting stories about people, places, and practical advice to help you plan your next vacation. Hey, hello, and thank you so much for joining us today for the Midlife Traveler podcast. My name is Laura, and we are recording a series on Scotland where you're learning about Scotland through the voice, the opinions, and the mind of a Scotsman named James. In this particular episode, we are exploring Scottish culture, both past and present. And more specifically, we're talking about the historic divide and the differences between Scottish culture today and the history knowledge and between the Scottish mainland and the Scottish Highland Island areas, particularly the Outer Hebrides, where James grew up. And one thing that is really interesting about this episode is it's it's really personal. So as a boy, James grew up in the Island Highland area, so he grew up steeped in clan tradition, including things like wearing the kilt, bagpipe music, the seriousness of the gathering of the clans, and of course, also speaking Gaelic. So when, when James was young, his family ended up moving to the mainland of Scotland, and it really wasn't until that point that he realized he was different that he understood that the world as he knew it as he grew up, particularly for something basic like language, was not the same. So you're going to hear through James's voice a bit about the Gaelic language history that continues to live on today through things like city names, you know, whether modern Scotsmen realize it or not. And Personally, I'm really grateful that James shared his personal perspective with me and thankful that he also is allowing me to share this with you because it's interesting. It's an interesting personal story and it's also a really terrific way of understanding both the history of a language and also its influence through things like maps and geography. So without further ado, here is James to tell you all about it. It's a great story, and I hope you enjoy. Thanks again for listening. Um, It was more obvious to me because I wasn't prepared as a child that the culture was going to be different on the mainland. I didn't know the other children wouldn't know my language. So that, that I was this woke me up even more to to to, to try to hold on more to the culture of, of of what the Scots culture once was. I'm not saying there's not a, a, a Scottish culture on the mainland today, but it's a new culture for Scottish history. It's only been that type of culture since the seventeen forty five. The Scottish history goes so much further back than that. So um I, I do worry about the, the loss of, of, of certain things within the language, 
mainly because they have a, a more deeper meaning or description of perhaps what happened somewhere or perhaps the lay of the land. Uh, and as a language changes, people just they, they just think it's the name of something rather than uh, actually having a meaning. Ah, oh, like what? Like Inverness. You know, so Inver, in, in the Gaelic language, it, it means at the end of water, an, an Inver. So you'll see all through Scotland places called Invergarry, Invermoriston, Inverness, so on and so forth. And uh, beside, beside all these towns, there'll, there'll be a big body of water. And that town will be at the headland. So, Inver at the end of water. A ness is a strip of arable, fertile farmland that is in between the sea and fresh water. So, Inverness, the strip of land between the sea at the end of the loch. Because at the end of loch. Ness, ness. exactly. <laughs> so, because it was before a time of maps. So, oh, you should go here. Where's that? How'd I get there? Oh, right. Well, it's an, it's an Inverness. It's, it's the, the strip of land at the end of the loch. So it was a way of, of not just naming places, but giving them a description so that when people were travelling, they could see it and they would find it. Whereas now, most people, you would ask, you know, why is it called Inverness? And they would just say, because that's its name. So I worry that, you know, through that we lose, forget, you know, why things were, were named and, and what they were called. Like, we've got a place called Alnwick Castle. So an Aln in the old Gaelic was a bay of safety, a oh. harbour. And Wick or Vic, Viking, the bay of the Vikings. Oh, Alnwick. really? Yes, oh. Vic or Vic being Viking. So there's, there's a lot of connotations within the language that are big references to how the land looks from the ocean. Because that's, that's how it was being viewed and surveyed. Well before we were ever up in plains, land was being mapped and right. surveyed from the sea. So it was a way of describing to other men, well, is it a bay? Is it an inlet? Is it a fjord? Is it a strait? Is it a firth? Lots of different words for, for the descriptive lay of land as it met the sea. So and that, that way you could being, navigate. Being uh, put into either the town or the Yeah, building, Yeah, or? Very, very much so. You know, you know like, for example, Port Ree. Uh, in, in the far north, many people call it Port Tree. It's two words: Port meaning harbour and Re meaning king. And Port Re in the Isle of Skye was built when King James VII and II was exiled to France for the hope of his return. But a lot of people like that. What's well, just the name of the place? It's called Port Tree. No, it's called Port as in harbour and Re for as the in king. the old Gaelic for king. So you know things like this. I don't. I don't want to forget because they're important. You know it's. A group of people at that time who were so passionate about their king that with their own hands they built a harbour for him in his own return. I don't want them to be forgotten for that. And they will be if we're like, oh, Port Rue. <laughs> Instead of not knowing the, the significance behind the name as well. So thanks for listening to the Midlife Traveler podcast. If you're looking for any of the resources that were mentioned in today's episode, please go online to our website at amidlifetraveler.com. Also, we'd really appreciate it if you subscribe, rate, and review us online and uh, just send us a note. Tell us what you think about the podcast. We would really appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs>